for having me. All right, have a seat. Sure. Uh, Hello there, welcome to MNB World Talk Show. Today we have invited someone, a very interesting person, who has made his hobby his career. He has travelled around the world, he has DJed in 23 countries around the world, and he also has brought so many new concepts into Mongolian music industry over the years. Well, this person is DJ Brian Afantha. Yes, sir. So Wonderful to meet you. Thank yeah, you for having yeah. me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for coming in here. Always a pleasure to come into Mongolia. Yeah. So, okay, my first question. All right. You studied philosophy. Yeah. And you are DJ now. Yeah. Why? <laughs> What's well, the connection in there? Well, I think, uh -huh. um, you know, I started the love of philosophy. Um, and philosophy means love of knowledge when I was in high school. And by my senior year, I was the president of my philosophy club. Mm. And I think um, I always like to conceptualize things and kind of understand them in a deep way. You know, some mm -hmm. people just listen to a song mm -hmm. and they just enjoy the song and mm -hmm. it just kind of ends there. Mm -hmm. but, but I always like to think deeper. Where does this come from? How does this mm -hmm. connect to other music? So in a way, I think those things are connected. You, it's looking past just the surface level. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say there's a direct connection between the two things, but mm -hmm. I think if you look at the motivation for getting into philosophy, in some ways it's very similar to getting into DJing. Mm -hmm. So when did you get into DJ? And what was the turning point? I mean, you were interested in music, okay, sure. as, as a, a young teenager, but when did you really get into DJing? Well, I, I remember they had a career day in high school, ah. and they said, uh, what career would you like to do? And they had kind of a lottery or a thing where they try to connect you with professionals. Mm -hmm. I chose DJing even then. I did a mm -hmm. guest spot on the radio, Y100 in South Florida. Mm -hmm. But that really didn't get my career going because there's a lot of misunderstanding. And also, I was still kind of trying to decide my own path in a way and how I would get into things. So when I went to college at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida, North Florida, mm -hmm. I was playing in bands, mm -hmm. I was producing shows, and part of that, sort of that DIY spirit, that do-it-yourself spirit, was mm -hmm. putting on playlists in between the shows. And as someone who always really loved music and was willing to deep in, dig into it deeper, I think I got a lot of compliments in that thing. I got a lot of initial mm -hmm. praise, which was very motivating and very mm -hmm. encouraging. So, um, in addition to playing with the band, I started DJing just solo there. And at the time, the t my technical skill was very mm -hmm. low, but I just was very enthusiastic and mm -hmm. something wanted, I wanted to get into. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went to Mongolia, I went to South Florida. Mm -hmm. Give some uh, photo introduction, photo and resume introduction let's do about it. our guests, right? Uh, and let's show who you are on photos and papers. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay, let's take a look at that. So, Brian, you have been around the countries. <laughs> I've been around. Yeah. All around, around the globe. You're holding the globe, globe, right? Yes, yes. yes. All, around all around. Okay. What was the most memorable location? Oh, I mean, that's so difficult because... No, no, the, the first thing strikes in your mind. The first thing that, I, that strikes my mind... No thinking. Is, is okay, though... <laughs> Um, one, one of them would have to be doing DJing the first hip-hop dance competition in Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Okay. Yes, yeah, so it was in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. I was on my second uh, trip there. Mm -hmm. And I love that sort of youthful energy and spirit. Mm -hmm. And I kind of encountered that in the new hip-hop dance community, you know, b-boying and mm -hmm. sea walking in Bangladesh. I love the spirit of the music there. Mm -hmm. and the spirit of dance there. It's so brand new. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And when I did that, I really made a strong connection with the people there. Mm -hmm. And I love it. And I look forward to going back for the third time at the end of this year. Oh, that, sure. that's, that's the one that I, that, that I most thought of first. But mm -hmm. I know the one that other people think of. I kinda, okay. I'm a philosopher. Okay? Yeah, yeah, I got to yeah, think yeah, of different yeah, angles. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the one is I DJed in North Korea. I was North the first Korea. DJ in North Korea. Wow. Yeah, it, wow. Was, a, yeah, it really? was a very interesting experience. Uh -huh. um, it's with a group called Choreo Tours. And the short version of the story is I helped out this kind of tour agency with a project of theirs, mm -hmm. and they wanted to pay me. And I said, I will not accept payment. I want to DJ North Korea. And they said, impossible. And I said, I want to DJ North Korea. And they said, no. Uh -huh. And then that went around. I went uh -huh. back and back. Uh -huh. And they're like, okay, okay, let's think about this. And eventually we were able to work it out where I was able to DJ in a big basement area there. And we made posters, and we had North Korean people uh -huh. who had never danced in an unchoreographed way before, uh -huh. and expats uh -huh. with Red Cross and other agencies uh -huh. there, and some tourists. And uh -huh. that was a very special experience for me. I mean, sounds very special. I mean, it was, was there any sure. restriction from the government side? Or, I mean, I, I've never been there because, yeah. you know. If there is a lot of restrictions. Um, we got a little bit more freedom in the sense that we were able to get away from the tour groups a little bit. Uh -huh. we, I did a lot of the major tour things mm -hmm. um, because they do supervise things very closely. In fact, this is a very funny story. I met a Mongolian person there. I really <laughs> scared them. Because uh -huh. they were in a supermarket uh -huh. there, uh -huh. and I started speaking to them in Mongolian, and I think I almost gave them a heart attack because the, wow. the idea that they're in North Korea and a white <laughs> and guy in North, in North guy, Korea, American guy, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, kind of shocked them. Uh -huh. um, they they kind of gave me some restrictions. Mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily follow all of them, mm -hmm. um, but um, it was a very beautiful experience. After graduating college, mm -hmm. you signed for Peace Corp. I was in the Peace Corps. I joined the Peace Corps. Yeah, you, you joined the Peace Corps and then you came to Mongolia. Yes. When was it? And this what was your first impression about Mongolia? Okay, so this is 2007. Mm -hmm. And I always loved doing volunteer work, charity work, philanthropy, philanthropy work, and mm -hmm. I always loved traveling. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was doing just regional traveling, not going mm -hmm. to any place as at the time I considered exotic like Mongolia. Mm -hmm. But those things and... I really wanted to get going. So I was able to time things perfectly where I could apply for the Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot of Western people who end up in Asia, maybe they grew up as cinephiles, really interested in Chinese culture, or samurais mm -hmm. in Japan, mm -hmm. or, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, they grew up. I did not necessarily have that conception. Like, no, I was not someone who dreamed about going to Asia. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You know, it yes. just kind of happened. Like, they offered it to me, and I said, all right, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And, I mean... It's such a ex special experience, Mongolia. You know, like I, I just had some Mongolian artists here. One, mm -hmm. one was a Singaporean singer rapper. Mm -hmm. She's like, I've been to thirty countries. None of them are like Mongolia. Mm -hmm. A group, a punk rock band called Conqueror Stress. And like, I've been to many places. Nothing like Mongolia. Mm -hmm. My first impression, I mean, the the, just the space kind of hits you. <laughs> just just the, the spacious feeling. Just the space, the blue sky, uh -huh. the the. Um, just the step kind of hits you. Uh -huh. um, eventually, the weather hits you. <laughs> eventually. <thing>. But <laughs> I came in the summer, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. But like Mongolia is such a place connected to the climate and the, of the environment. Mm -hmm. And that strikes you as differently. You know, I was in the Peace Corps. You know, people always people ask me mm -hmm. about moving to Mongolia a lot, which is an impossible question. Mm -hmm. How do you break down years and such a rich culture like Mongolia? Mm -hmm. But one thing I can say is this when I speak to Western people. Mm -hmm. I went from living in humid, hot South Florida mm -hmm. to cold, dry Mongolia, eventually. Mm -hmm. But the, the most important difference is I went from living in Florida to living in a developing country, mm -hmm. a place where the economy is still growing, where there's a lot of things. And that idea was the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Going from living in America mm -hmm. or streets of paved gold, mm -hmm. there's lots of wealth, all that sort of nonsense, yeah. to development country, that was a very important decision that I made and something that I recommend to everyone in the West. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, since 2007, what, 12 years now? Yeah, it's like 12, 12 years, years now. Yeah. You've made many friends. And Absolutely. And we prepared a small package, a small sure. video about your friends and your partners in crime yeah. <laughs> yeah okay let's take a look at that package
This is my friend Hayasan representing Total Eyes Sound in Nagoya, Japan. I met yeah, I met him through a Korean friend who lived in Shanghai. He said our styles would go well together, and they do. Now we're good friends. We've done four tours now. Very good style. This is a reggae skateboarding hamburger man. This is Meja one. As I tell her all the time, it always makes her smile. It makes me happy. I started as a fan of Meja one. It's true. I discovered her music in Malaysia. And, and not only does she make really interesting music, she has a very fascinating history and is a great personality. And now I had a DJ to DJ at an event for her before. This is the first kind of tour we've done together. She has uh, amazing music. It's great to have her here on the tour. When I, when I first met Jalka, we talked a lot about classic rock. One of the first projects we did involved Elvis Presley. I really love rock and roll music. It's probably my first love. But rock and roll has lots of connections to other genres. You can take certain people and you can connect them to other places. For example, I really loved Lord Flea, who I discovered through Harry Belafonte. And Lord Flea was really influenced by 1950s rhythm and blues music. And you get from there, and you get to uh, Laurel Aitken, who was, uh, took a lot of rhythm and blues music from America and mixed it with reggae music. So there, you can discover reggae music. So someone like Hayasan, the reason we connected so well was he's not just a reggae man, not just dancehall man. He uses soul music and funk and disco. Same problems that I kind of have, where people just want one genre. But when you open up the sound, I think it makes it more special, more unique. Major One started off doing hip hop. This was, this is the first time of the B-Girl in Mongolia, but it's also the return of the B-Girl. And then she does lots of different genres, sounds, mixing in you know, Japanese and Korean dance hall and Jamaican sounds and flavors, all sorts of things. And Macho is a guy doing his thing with reggae sounds here. And I'm trying to connect him with a Latin restaurant and we bring some Latin reggae music. I think genre is something that's useful to talk about, but it also can be very restricting and it's a useful marketing tool, but I'm just more interested in the artistic ideas, bringing together cultures. A lot of what I do is trying to cross, not just genres, but cross countries. When you do that, you create interesting symmetry, interesting fusion of styles. Well, you and your friends with music, connection with music. Absolutely. <laughs> Connecting people through music is a primary thing that I do, I think. Well, what is your impression or what is your take on Mongolian musical industry? What we are, what we, what Mongolian artists are doing right? Yeah. And what they are doing wrong? Very good question. That's mm -hmm. a very difficult question. I mean, Mongolia... Just based on your experience. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to be said on anyone else's. Uh, like, <laughs> like one thing, the first thing that I think about with Mongolia and music is, mm -hmm. it's such a culture to connect it to music. Mm -hmm. You know, you, I brought people to the countryside on this recent trip, artists there. Mm -hmm. You go into someone's home and they're singing. They're sitting around singing. You know, mm -hmm. you might drink some vodka. You might, mm -hmm. and you know, a grandmother will sing and someone will sing. And like, Mongolian people will have 20, 30 folk songs they can get to at a drop of their hat. I don't know, the gym, and all, you know, like all these great, nice melodies and stuff. That's not something you necessarily see in the West. There are people are distracted by their phones and stuff. <laughs> Industry-wise, um, it's tough. Um, there are people who are doing a lot of good things. Mohanic is a band I've seen develop so much, mm -hmm. and now they're able to tour a lot, play internationally. Mm -hmm. um, Playtime has really developed, mm -hmm. Natska and, mm -hmm. and uh, Hi-Fi Records, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and of course, The Who, are they're yeah, selling out all, all yeah. across Europe. I think that um, one thing I can say is that there are artists who become successful in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. and I feel like, like they become comfortable in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily want to kind of start anew in other places. Uh -huh. Whereas I feel like a lot of successful artists, mm -hmm. you might conceive of them playing always in front of adoring crowds and loving big audiences. Mm -hmm. 
But there's a lot of groundwork where you're playing for small audiences and you're developing relationships. Mm -hmm. And I feel like some artists in Mongolia, mm -hmm. they reach a certain level, they, they don't want to reach they, out. They, they, they get enough, like, okay. Yeah. They get that feeling, okay, I'm, I'm okay now. You know, I think in a, lar a, a large sense. Stop I mean, breaking grounds, new grounds. Yeah, I, f I feel like there are some artists that I've mm -hmm. worked with and stuff that I've done this where I feel like they're almost either just comfortable in Mongolia, mm -hmm. you know, they don't want to be compared to other places, mm -hmm. or may, they might just kind of have inferiority complex with just being Mongolian and comparing mm -hmm. themselves to places of other nationalities. Mm -hmm. But whereas, like, I brought, um, on this most recent trip, I brought an artist from Singapore, Meiji mm -hmm. one, and I brought DJ Hayasan from Japan. Mm -hmm. And both of them... I can show you videos of them playing for hundreds and thousands of people, mm -hmm. but both of them also love playing for smaller audiences. Smaller audiences. Mm -hmm. People who don't know them, because mm -hmm. that gives them a chance to connect with new people mm -hmm. and stuff. There's an artistry there. Yeah. So, okay, Our, my next question is industry-wise. Industry. Yeah. yeah. We have a very small market, as you know. It's only sure. three million people here. Sure. What is the way, what are the ways, smart ways, management, to, to break grounds in international market for Mongolian musical artists? Well, in a lot the of... the management-wise, because you're a producer as well. Right? Yeah, um, I work on um, compilation albums where I've been able to feature Mongolian artists like mm -hmm. Yuga mm -hmm. and Mrs. M and uh, Mohanek, and we mm -hmm. have some more um, coming up. I think um, it's a difficult thing to say right now, especially... In the international market, mm -hmm. how do people get attention? You know, because mm -hmm. it's it's a very different different than it used to be, just mm -hmm. internationally, not just in Mongolia. Mm -hmm. But I I think laying the ground. So the industry is changing. The industry internationally mm -hmm. is changing. And how is it changing? It's changing say. that people are not necessarily buying music. That people uh -huh. want to connect with the artists through things like streaming, or they don't want to pay. They want to just music video clips, it's, it's a much different way of connecting with people. Mm -hmm. They want a live music experience. Mm -hmm. And developing, one thing with Mongolia is there's not necessarily a strong club live music culture. It was something mm -hmm. that I've always worked on. In some ways it's improving in UB. And let's be mm -hmm. clear, mm -hmm. I, I don't like people who talk about things they don't necessarily know about. Mm -hmm. I was very strongly connected with the Mongolian local music scene. Mm -hmm. I am now somewhat. I keep my tabs on it, but mm -hmm. I'm not here on the ground every day. Mm -hmm. But it still seems like the idea of a local band playing a 45-minute set of new material on a very regular basis mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily happen. And that's kind of the market that people do internationally, is that they're playing club shows for 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. and they're doing it without music stands with lyrics. Mm -hmm. And they're grinding it out and building fans and willing to do it for smaller audiences mm -hmm just as a chance to develop themselves. You have artists who have, in Mongolia, have music videos, mm -hmm. and they have branding, but they only have one song released or two songs released. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it's very different than how they do it in other places. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage groups to build their live act so that they can go to other places and perform. As you know, we have prepared some footage of videos yeah. about reggae, Nadam, and what's happening around there. And uh, let's take a look about the first reggae, Nadam in Mongolia. What is it? Hi, my name is Brian Offenther. In July 2012, I took the indie rock band Banana Monkey to be the very first rock band from China to tour Mongolia. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Bono. I'm a singer. Bono. Not here. So fresh. <laughs> victory! I declare victory for Rock Nada. We are at the Victory Center here at UB for the Meat and Potatoes show for the Rock Nada 2012 tour. What I mean is, we are in a big city. We are at a show for young people, and it's going to be some rock and roll. <laughs> Yeah. 
Hi guys, we're here on the final day for our Rock and Auto 2 tour. In a few hours, we're heading back to Beijing. I think Mongolia, people in Mongolia really appreciate that they saw something really new, you know. They saw a real club show in Banana Monkey played in Sukhbatter Square, which is fairly ridiculous that we got a Chinese band. You know, I really feel like we pulled one over on the gods for that one. And we visited Darkhan, and I think the Banana Monkey guys really, really opened their eyes to a new experience, and that's really what life's about. I'm really excited to head back and uh, get get start working on Rock Nottam Tour number three. So until then, I bid you birthday. So you are a DJ. Yes, and, sir. And uh, your stage name is DJ Bo. Correct. Bo. Yes. What is your philosophy and aesthetic behind your performances? Yeah, well this goes back to the philosophy thing. It's something that I mm -hmm. think about a lot. The art of philosophy, uh, not philosophy, <laughs> the art of, <laughs> art of yeah, that, that okay. was kind of going back there. The art of DJing mm -hmm. is a lot like film. And I say that because you can read Eisenstein and other early film theorists where it's the art of the montage. Where if you're watching a movie, especially when you're watching old style film, mm -hmm. you're, you conceive of it as being live movement, but what you're really seeing is a series of pictures. Yes. And film is the art of these pictures moving all together and mm -hmm. conceiving. So DJing, in a lot of ways, is like that. You're taking one song or a part of song, and then you're going to the next one, and that in-between, that fusion, mm -hmm. is kind of where the art lies. Do you mm -hmm. mix things on top? Do you do things after? Is there a pause? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a big part of what I do and kind of how I conceive of DJing. Mm -hmm. Another one is I'm very much um, influenced by early hip-hop DJing mm -hmm. from the uh, late 70s and the very mm -hmm. early 80s, where the idea is to recontextualize things. Take songs or parts of songs mm -hmm. that might have been made by a group of people at a different time, at a different mm -hmm. place, mm -hmm. but you put them in a different space. Mm -hmm. and you get something new from them. Mm -hmm. So songs that weren't necessarily made to be hip-hop songs can be configured to be that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very important thing. And another aspect, I'm very much influenced by radio DJs from the 50s of finding new music to be mm -hmm. discovered, putting your own stamp on what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, taking songs that people don't know or don't hear mm -hmm. and giving them a chance to do it. I, the, nothing makes me happier than when someone comes up to me and says, hey, what song is that? What do you like to give through your performance to your audience? Wow, good question. I call the main nights that I do Border Breaks International Funky Sounds. Mm -hmm. And to me, I like to give them a slice of the places that I've been. Even if they don't uh -huh. have the places that I've been to, they can do that. And digitally, I'm able to do that in a lot of ways. But like, for example, like, uh, I like to get the CDs. I like to get the physical copies because mm -hmm. it's kind of an artifact of what it is. So, for example, I have a record here mm -hmm. of music from Singapore. Yeah. Um, I've yeah. been to Singapore. Mm -hmm. I've DJed there. Mm -hmm. I work with Singaporean artists like Major One. Mm -hmm. To me, like, it's easy to go online now and just go on YouTube and search things. But when you DJ with records, mm -hmm. it's just, first of all, it's easier to demonstrate what you're doing instead mm -hmm. of just seeing someone on their laptop going uh -huh, boop, boop, uh -huh, and uh -huh. standing there and going like this. Mm -hmm. When you have records, it's easier to do. Um, but it also shows that you're dedicated, that you put the time in, mm -hmm. and in, in ways it, it, you, you have that sort of physical representation. Nice. That's why I do, I would say most of my gigs at this point are mm -hmm. with vinyl with vinyl and you like to give bits and pieces of different places, right? Yeah, records mm -hmm. like this. Records. 
Okay. I met recently. Here's a here's a preview. Here's a hint. Don't tell anyone. Okay. <laughs> I right. met recently me. with the Ulaanbaatar Vinyl Club because there's a group of guys who meet every week. Uh -huh. The um, the alternative singer Akko was there. Okay. Great singer. And we, I really next time. This time mm -hmm. I I brought Hayasan, who is a world class vinyl DJ. Mm -hmm. But next time I want to bring, not reggae Nadam, not punk rock mm -hmm. Nadam, not anything like that. Maybe we'll do vinyl Nadam. And do all oh, record DJs from around the world in Mongolia. New and exotic vinyl natum. I, in oh. some ways, it's new, but also it's old. <laughs> it is old. I mean, yes, yeah, yes. But yes. exactly, but I, bringing yeah, bringing that stuff you know, back in here. To me, that's the mm -hmm. one of the great things about DJing is mm -hmm. I have a, a simple phrase that I use. If I'm DJing a song, that song could have been made in the 20s. It could be an Al Jolson song. It could be mm -hmm. made in the 50s. It could mm -hmm. be a Chuck Berry mm -hmm. song. Could be made ten years ago from mm -hmm. the lemons, but if you have not heard it before, mm -hmm. it's brand new to you. It is a new yeah world, new universe. It's brand new. It right? could have been recorded. That's it's time travel. Time you know travel. when you're yes. listening to music yes. from different yes. periods. Okay, my last question. Oh god, it's you, been you, pleasure. You. We I think we cannot stop talking. <laughs> I, I love talking. It's very to hard to stop talking with you. It's it's always new things coming up. You're but asking anyways, very good questions. I really we have appreciate uh, that. limited time, and oh, then. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll have to come back next time. <laughs> yes, next time. Next time okay, when you come back to Bozani. Thank you. Sorry to impose on you. <laughs> My question is, it's a tradition. Ask yep. about future. Mm -hmm. What is your future vision? My future vision, as you can kind of see, I very much go with the flow. Yes. When opportunities come, mm -hmm. I kind of take them. Um, I very much will continue DJing in new, interesting places around the world mm -hmm. and taking those sounds mm -hmm. and bringing them internationally. Mm -hmm. I'm at 23 countries now. Hopefully, by the time I'm back to talking to you, I'm at least at 30. Okay. I, have, I already have 20 plans. And that includes going to some places back multiple times. Mm -hmm. That's important to me. I want to keep developing the Mongolian music connection mm -hmm. through these compilation CDs I put out. I, if your audience is interested, they can go on Spotify or Amazon or anywhere mm -hmm. and look up Spin Presents Indie Asia. Spin Presents Indie Asia. Spin is an American mm -hmm. magazine. If they look at Spin Presents Indie Asia, we did volume one mm -hmm. that had Mohanic on it. I'm um, lucky enough to volume two has been approved. We will mm -hmm. be moving forward volume two. By mm -hmm. the way, volume one we're going to make into vinyl. So next oh, time I'll bring nice. you a copy of volume Please one. Please do, record. yes. But, but I'm going to keep doing that because I think the Asian music connection is important. Mm -hmm. And I just really want to be able to personally as a DJ myself, but bring international artists to new places where people don't necessarily conceive of them mm -hmm. and connect people connect them through together. culture. Mm -hmm. through music. Well, thank you very much. It's been a ah, pleasure. Mash by your slav. Thank you Mash very much. Mash by your slav. All right. Well, uh, this is DJ Brian Offenter. Correct, sir. And uh, I hope you enjoyed our talk show. To me, it was too interesting. <laughs> and uh, we will see you next week. Bye-bye.